Good day. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Douglas Harder, and in this topic we're going to look at the tree data structure. We're going to start by defining the tree data structure and look at some of its components. We're going to look at concepts such as the root node, internal nodes, and leaf nodes. We'll describe the relationship or the hierarchical relationship in terms of parents, siblings, and children. We'll look at or define ordered and unordered trees. Within the tree we will define a path, we'll look at the path length, and then we'll be able to define the height of a tree as well as the depth of a node within a tree. We'll define ancestors and descendants, and then we'll look at subtrees. We'll look at some examples, HTML and cascading style sheets. Now, trees are going to be the first data structure that you're going to see in this course that are significantly different from what you've seen in your first year programming courses. There you saw arrays and linked lists. Now trees themselves are very similar to linked lists in the sense that there is always a first or a root node and every single node within a tree may have zero or more next pointers. The root node here has two next pointers pointing at two other nodes. Node I is pointing at three nodes. At this uh, on the other hand, you'll notice that every single node within the tree other than the root node has exactly one node that's pointing to it. H is pointing to I, I is pointing to J. So we will basically say that every single node may have zero or more children, or child nodes, usually children. The root node has no node pointing to it, that is, it has no parent. Every other node, on the, on the other hand, will have exactly one unique parent. Here we have node I, its parent is node H, and it has three children, J, K, and L. Now, the number of children within a node is said to be the degree of the node. So in this case, node I has degree 3, and its children, J, K, and L, are said to be siblings. Now here we have a phylogenetic tree of Carnivora morpha. Now in this case, most nodes will have either two children or zero children. Now a node that has degree zero, or it has no children, is said to be a leaf node. So these are the leaf nodes in this particular tree. Any other node within the tree is said to be internal to the tree, or an internal node. In the phylogenetic tree, these are all of the leaf nodes. The balance are all, or must be by definition, internal nodes. They have at least one child. Now let's take a look at these two trees. Both have A as its root, but in this case the children are B and E. In this example we have E and B as its children. Now are these trees the same or not? If we consider these trees to be the same, we will, we will say that we are dealing with unordered trees. On the other hand, if the order of the children is relevant, then we will say that we are dealing with ordered trees, in which case these two trees will be said to be different. Now, we're always going to be looking at ordered trees in this course. However, if you have a strict hierarchical ordering, if you consider the children of a particular node, there may not be a relationship between them, and therefore there may be no ordering, and so therefore they would be unordered. However, we're going to find that it's actually very useful to impose an order on the children. Now, let's take a look at this tree. You'll notice that there is a natural path starting at the root going down towards any node within the tree. So therefore we're going to find a path in a tree, within a tree in the same way. A path is a sequence of nodes, A0, A1, A2, going all the way up to AN, containing N plus 1 nodes. We will say that as a path of length N, if each subsequent node within the tree, in the, within the path, is a child of the previous one. So for example, here I have a path, B, E, G. B is the parent of E, 
E is the parent of G. The length of that path is said to be true, 2. Now here we have two paths. Starting here, here we have one path of 11 nodes, and therefore it's length 10. Here we have a second path, starting with this node, going down here. It contains five nodes, and therefore its length is 4. The length of the, no of the path is the number of steps that must be taken to get from the first node to the last node. Now, therefore, if we take this root node, for every single node, there is a unique path from the root node. The length of that path will be said to be the depth of the node. In this case, E has depth 2, as do all these other nodes here. Similarly, L has depth 3, as do all the other nodes that have a path of length 3 from the root node. In this example, we know that the root node is at depth 0. The root node has a path containing only one element in it. If it has a path going to it of only one element, the length of that path is 0. These are the nodes at depth 4, depth 9, 14, and we have four nodes at depth 17. So the height of a tree is going to be defined as the maximum depth of any node within the tree. The height of a tree with just one node, a root node with no children, will be said to have height 0. And for convenience, we will define the height of a tree that has 0 nodes in it to have height negative 1. This will actually come in very useful with a number of the data structures that we'll look at in subsequent topics. In this example, the height of this uh, phylogenetic tree is height 17. The height or the depth, the largest depth of any node within the tree. Now, suppose we have a node A and a node B, and there exists a path from node A to node B. If that's true, we will say that A is an ancestor of B, and B is a descendant of node A. Now, remember, a path with just one node in it is a path of length 0, and so technically there exists a path from a node to itself. It's a trivial path of length 0, but it exists. So therefore, every single node is both an ancestor and a descendant of itself. If we want to avoid that equality, we can use the terminology strict descendant or strict ancestor. Now, the root node within a tree is therefore the ancestor of all nodes within the tree. So, for example, the descendants of node B here are C, D, F, E, F, and G. The ancestors of node I are A, H, and I. Looking at this tree, all the descendants of this node include all of those descendants. This node is an ancestor for every single node within that subtree. In fact, if you block it out, you can see that this itself appears to look as if it is a tree. On the other hand, if we consider just the ancestors of a particular node, you will note that this forms a linear path to the root node. So in fact, there's a linear ordering between all the nodes from the root node to a particular node within the tree. Now, another way of defining a tree is to define it recursively. How do we do this? Well, we will simply state that a node of degree 0 is said to be a tree. So any single node is a tree or a leaf node. A node of degree n is said to be a tree if it has n children, and each of these children are themselves disjoint trees. That is, none of the nodes within those trees intersect. So, therefore, given any particular node within a tree, let's say it's rooted here, if we take any particular node and all of its descendants, this forms a subtree. Here we have E, all of its descendants forms a subtree rooted at E. So again, in this example, 
all of these descendants of this particular node form a subtree rooted at that particular node. Now, we're going to look at some examples using HTML and cascading style sheets. Now, markup language HTML actually does have a tree structure, at least if you follow the rules. Cascading style sheets use this tree structure to modify the display of HTML. We'll see how this, this is done. Consider this HTML document. We have a head and a body. So essentially the HTML tag has two children. Similarly, the body has two children, one heading and one paragraph. Similarly, the body, this paragraph, has some text, some underlining, and some further text. So this basically says that we can actually define a tree structure. HTML is the root. It has two children, head and body. The head has a single title which contains a string. The body has two children, a heading, and a paragraph, and so on and so forth. The web browser takes this and says, ah, we have a head here, we have a title within the head that's displayed in the title bar. Everything that is a descendant of the H1 tag is displayed as a heading at a particular as a heading of a particular size. Anything that is descendant of underlining is underlined within the browser. Now, if we're following the rules of XML, tags must be nested. We've already seen this when we discussed stacks. So for example, if we actually wanted to have 1, 2, 3 underlined, 4, 5, 6 both bold and underlined, and 7, 8, 9 just bold, we can have the following markup. We can start the underlining, start the bold, terminate the bold, terminate the underlining, and make the rest bold. Technically, you should not be able to use this format because, again, the rule we learned pre previously is that any closing tag must match the most recent opening tag. Again, that's used very commonly within XML parsers. That is what makes it possible to write XML parsers that are so universally used. Very much in difference or in contra uh, in comparison with the more general SG SGML. Now, cascading style sheets actually make use of this tree structure. So basically, you can use cascading style sheets to, display, to dictate how it should appear. So here we have a style. Anything that is a heading or an H1 should be colored blue. This, and this basically says anything at all that is a descendant of an H1 heading should be displayed as blue. So for example, if I use this style, then all descendants of this particular H1 tag will be displayed blue in the browser. Now, on the other hand, if I add another one here that says everything that is underlined should be red, well then, well, this is now a descendant of the underlining tag, which should be colored red, so therefore red is highlighted both as a descendant of Underlining is read both as a descendant of H1 and as a descendant of a paragraph tag. But what happens if you only want underlining that is read, sorry, underlining that is a descendant of a paragraph tag to be displayed as read? In that case, you may want only text that appears as a descendant of this parent or ancestor. Well, we can actually do that. We can say PU. So only those underlined tags that are descended from paragraph tags should be displayed as red. In this case, this underlining is not does not have a parent tag in its ancestry, and therefore it will not be displayed as red. 
So basically you can read this as saying text or decorations descendant from the underlining tag which itself is a descendant of a paragraph tag should be colored as red. Now, in general, any XML can be displayed as a tree. All XML tools make use of these features. And when you parse XML, it's going to convert it to an internal tree structures. XML transformations actually will manipulate these trees. Now here's an example of MathML. Now if we want to encode x squared plus y squared equals z squared, this is one such description. That's a lot just for x squared plus y squared equals z squared. However, this is necessary if you want to transmit mathematics, including what is the information contained. What does this mean? Is that square powering or does it mean something else? Is this addition or is this addition within some other context? This is the tree structure of the previous MathML expression. We have a root math and it has a semantics child. What the semantics child says is that you can actually re-describe it in one, one of three ways. Here we have simply the structure. What is the actual, how should this actually be displayed if you want to present the mathematics. We have powers, we have numbers, we have identifiers. Annotation XML is a tree structure which actually describes what is the context. So we are applying an equality between two objects. We are applying a power on an identifier and a number. So again, we are trying to actually state what the mathematics is. Finally, I actually added a further annotation, and that annotation was the maple representation of that, XML, of that mathematical expression. So why do we actually want to do this? Why do we want to use 500 characters to describe 2, 4, 6, 8 characters? Why not just print, display it? Well. An image is actually much more expensive than 500 characters, and we still do want to say, how should it look? How do we present it? What information does it contain? What is the context of these symbols? And in this case, I'm also providing a specific translation to one language, in this case, Maple. Okay, so in this topic, we've introduced the terminology that is used to describe the tree data structure. We've used describe various terms, including the root node, leaf nodes, internal nodes. We define parents, children, and siblings as a relationship of a particular node. We define ordered trees and unordered trees, paths, path length, the depth of a node within a tree versus the height of a tree being the maximum, ancestors, descendants, and subtrees. Finally, we looked at HTML and cascading style sheets. Thank you very much and have a good day.